Hi, I'm Irvin. Let's talk about Irwin. As we begin today, our heroes aren't in the best of shape. Looks like we're in for it. Yeah, and it's still a good long walk back to camp, too. I'm glad we left Betty and Barry back there. This is really rugged. Yeah. Here we are. How are we doing? Terrible. Oh. I don't think I can go another step. We never will find out what they're doing out there or why Valerie is with them, but right now it doesn't matter. They need a place to get out of this storm. Dan spots a house not far away. May as well make for it. If nothing else, it might have a crawl space they can take shelter in or something. Inside, there doesn't seem to be anybody home. It looks a lot like ball lightning, but it sets the stage for this place's creep factor. Steve says, let's find a place and some material and make a fire inside this old wooden rattle trap house. Nobody thinks that's a bad idea. Now, watch this next clip and notice something odd going on with our group. Someone is basically going to be dragging Valerie around like that for the whole hour. There's no explanation, no reason for such out-of-character behavior. They're just doing it. We haven't seen her make any mistakes, and Valerie isn't acting especially Valerie-ish, so it's a little off-putting to see them manhandling her like this. <laughs> No, a guy in a sheet. They'll run into that hole in the wall and discuss various viewpoints about the existence of ghosts. It's a guy in a sheet. Come on out, ghost. Yeah, ghost. Come on out and catch us. The guy in the sheet has apparently gone to try and haunt those rock-throwing kids, so now's their chance to get out of here. Never in all my life have I seen such a monstrous, horrifying sight. Oh, no, no, no! Look at the spooks we scared out of the haunted house. Hey, maybe they got in the rain and shrunk, huh? What up? Run! Hey, Fitzhugh, are those guys scarier than a guy in a sheet? What makes these two think they're ghosts is anybody's guess, because supposedly everybody in this part of the world knows all about the little people and all the rest. But these guys are determined to find spooks, whether there are any or not. I caught a couple. I don't think they're spooks at all. I think they're little people. Yeah. Put them down with a the one-eyed core and they will find out. This kid has his mind made up that they're spooks, but there's only one way to tell for sure. Poke them with a stick and see if it goes right through them. Uh, your friend was carrying two of them and they didn't pass right through his hands, but you get a serious vibe from these boys that says, I didn't pay attention in class. You can't do this to me. No. No. Watch them, I'll take a look. It didn't go through him, so you have your answer, genius. What's that? I don't know. Dad, it's Steve! I don't know if he's either. Oh! It's a smoke illusion, you dunderheads. You're clearly dealing with a magician. That would be the magician who just did that illusion. My mistake, it's Grandpa Joe. After the movie ended, Willy Wonka's elevator went out of control and they wound up here. 
He was the first successful test of that growth formula Jody came up with last episode. Now, notice I said the first successful test. An earlier test on Charlie is something Grandpa Joe doesn't like to talk about. They're not in there. I think I heard Pitchy croaking up there. Let's look around a bit and make sure. As I said, there's no good reason for it, and this episode even appeared in the order it was filmed almost. This aired as episode 22, but its filming order was 24. So Valerie should be even more developed than she should be. You know what I mean. And we'll discover that she is. It's sometimes hard to tell because of the way they monkeyed with the order of the episodes. For those who are interested, I'm going to try and remember to include a link in the description to a web page that lists the episodes, both in their filming and their airing orders. It reads kind of like a bingo card. <laughs> Maybe next time you want to talk first and stab later. Why have you come here? We just came in to get out of the wind. Who are you? What does it matter who I am? Who are you? Perhaps you would like to join your absent friend. If your motive in being here is without malice, I will not harm you. I believe Mark already told you their motive to get out of the weather. Where's Steve? He is safe. Prove it. And just to prove there are no hard feelings, he waves his wand and Steve is out of the jar and standing next to him again. This guy's pretty good. <laughs> Please, believe me. I think he's figured out that they're telling the truth and they don't mean him any harm. I tried to frighten you because I thought I was in danger. That the police had sent you. Why are you worried about the police? I escaped from prison. There is a price on my head, just as there is on yours. Truly, I mean you no harm. Dan says, then why did you knock them out and bring them here? I had to do that. To keep those terrible boys from capturing you. I guess he did rescue us from those bullies. Yeah, but uh, how? You want to know how? He'll show you. This is a picture of me several years ago. I am in need to. I rescued you from those boys with the only means I had. Illusion. It wasn't any illusion that you gassed them or, or whatever you did and brought them back here. Because of their size, the powder anesthetized them. The mist has a magnifying effect, and Steve stayed on his feet just long enough for it to work and scare the boys away. After that, it was a question of getting them all to safety until the gas wore off. Well, then why did you put Steve in the jar? You weren't trying to save him then. No, I was saving myself. <laughs> Come on, that's ridiculous. Perhaps, but he did attack me. And of all the things he could have done in retaliation, he chose to do no harm. I told them to talk first and stab later, but do they listen? No. Hey, yeah, right, but um, what I'd like to know is how did I get in and out of that jar? Ha-ha-ha! <laughs> Teleportation, my masterpiece. He won't explain how he does that, but he will give them another sample. I don't believe it. Oh, look, it's the only way to travel. <laughs> She's right about that. Imagine the possibilities. And imagine the awkward situations you could get yourself into if you dialed the address wrong. Mr. Nidu, why were you in prison? Uh, a little over two years ago, something went wrong during a performance. A man who volunteered from the audience died as a result. I was tried, convicted of involuntary manslaughter, and sentenced to two years in prison. When did you escape? Almost immediately. Since then, he's been disguising himself, going under several assumed names, and performing shows all over the place. After every show, he quietly sends all the money to the man's family, always anonymously. He had to do something for them, and he couldn't do anything from prison. So here he is. You're a very great man, Mr. Inidu. I wouldn't say that, sir. 
But I am a fair magician. This is delightful. Barry will love it. Who is Barry? A little boy, a child. He's with our group. He didn't come along today. Notice Dan's reaction. He's angry at Fitzhugh for revealing Barry's existence, even though it's clear this guy doesn't mean them any harm and in fact is willing to help them however he can. I wonder what kind of magic trick can knock that chip off his shoulder. Well then, let's do it right. Shush. Probably not that one. On the other hand, if Dan eats one of those, maybe he'll be a little less grumpy. Enidu explains that all his illusions are written in his special book, but nobody else can read a magician's book except his designated successor, It's Bad Luck. However, he'll give Fitzhugh a little taste of the things that are in the book. He makes the lollipops vanish, and instead he pours some green powder into Fitzhugh's hand. I'll throw the powder over the edge and stand back. <laughs> I've just performed one of my most prized creations. But there's nothing in the green smoke. Because if Fitzhugh was close enough for the illusion to work, it'd knock him out again. Hello? But you're there. Really, Valerie? He told you he's a magician and it's all illusion. Under those circumstances, nothing should produce a reaction like that. Everyone agrees that she was the character who grew the most over the course of the series, but we sure went out of our way to make it a bumpy ride. Enidu needs to go clean up the residue of his green smoke in case the police decide to investigate the boy's story. He also needs to check the grounds and make sure the police aren't already there. Or worse, the boys have come back. Perhaps I'd better take you down off the box before I go. Two of you hop on my hand. No, I'd like a magic ride instead. Like Valerie and Dan had. I'd like another one, too. My pleasure. A snap of the fingers and... He needs to teach them to do that. It'd save him a heap of table climbing. All his stuff is in a secret room, so nobody can tell he lives here. For all appearances, the place is abandoned, so nobody should bother them. <laughs> Except maybe him. He starts wandering around the place calling for Anidu. When there's no answer, he lights a candle and starts tossing the place, obviously looking for something. He spends a lot of time fishing through books, so it's not hard, for us at least, to guess what he's after. His actions strongly suggest that he's up to no good, so let's get rid of him. Mission accomplished and need you protected. Come in, come in, Enoch. Ah, Enoch, I'm so glad I found you before you left. Or not. The guy ransacking Enidu's place is none other than his old assistant, Enog. And Enidu has no idea what Enog was doing. He thinks this is just a visit from an old friend. Well, I heard the story on the newscast. I realized that it couldn't be anyone else. It had to be you, Enidu, master of magic. Ah, uh, Enog, Enog, it's so good to see you again. My old assistant, my dear friend. He says, remember how it was when we were the guys on that poster? We had a truck and trailer. Now everything I own is in two suitcases. Now uh, come. Tonight things will change. Let us sit and drink a toast to uh, our reunion and to the future. I'm afraid I only have coffee. Oh. What's this? Wine. Enidu is loving this. He conjures up a couple of glasses and it's time to toast. Tell me, you were joking about that poster, weren't you? 
I bet you haven't kept one all these years. Of course I have. I don't believe it. You know, I haven't seen one of those for... Please show it to me. Wait right here. Oh, he'll wait. Take your time. Anita returns with the poster. After a little nostalgia, it's time for that toast. To better days in the future. My toast will be to the old standby of the magicians. Friendship. If he drinks that, he's dead. They have to think of something. Fortunately, Steve comes up with a plan. You forgot your part of the magician's toast, Enoch. Come, 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 to friendship. You know the next line. Of course. I forgot completely. That's fortuitous because it gave Steve and the others a chance to get where they need to go. To friendship. The greatest magic of all. Now! Of course I... I don't know. As in right there. It's enough distraction to set them up for part two. How did you tip it over, Star Drawing? But I didn't tip it over, I... What's the matter, old friend? I don't think you want to drink the toast at all. I don't understand. Of course I want to drink it. We'll do it right now. I'll drink from the other glass. You lick that up from the floor. Enidu has no idea what's going on, but he has a fair idea who's doing it. The question is why. Oh, that's why. Now he knows why Enog is acting so strangely. Hey, you were right, Enog. I was trying to impress you with one of my new tricks. It was supposed to float in the air, the, the glasses on top of the tablecloth. I've been working on it for some time, but as you see, I haven't perfected it yet. I'm not sure Enog is buying it. Come, pour me another glass and we'll drink our toast. And this time, no tricks, I promise you. Where is your book, Anita? You used to always keep it with you. Are you still? My book? Your magic, the record of your creations, you know what book I mean. And now he knows why Enog is really here. How have you done as a magician? Not too well, as you can imagine. But someday, when I inherit the secrets of your book, I shall succeed you as the master. Show me some of the new tricks you've learned. Show me the book. You know I cannot do that. That's very bad luck. It's not bad luck to show your book to your heir, and I am your heir, am I not? And when did we make that arrangement? Inidu won't answer that one one way or the other. Instead, he says, if you want to be my heir, you have to prove to me that you're worthy. Show me what you can produce out of the hat. Is that all? What else is there? That's the trick. I remember. You don't like rabbits, Enoch. Enog isn't worthying himself very well. Just to rub his nose in it a little, Enidu says, the duck is too big for the hat, so now what do we do? Let me think. Perhaps someday I shall teach you that trick. But guess what? You're not ready to look in his book. Enog hangs his head in shame and leaves quietly. Yeah, sure. Not until I get that book, old man. Now, this is no trick rope. All your focus focus isn't going to help you now. Now, where is it? Without the use of his hands, there's nothing Anidu can do. The crew has to find a way to help him. You know, Steve, this is a long shot. But maybe we can work our way around behind him. And cut him loose. Yeah. Stay here. Always stay here. 
Leaving Fitzhugh behind, I get. He's not in the best of shape for intense things like climbing or walking more than 10 feet. But Valerie is a different matter. And we know the only reason they make her stay behind is because she's a girl. Supposedly, we've gotten over that by now, or perhaps not. The little people. <laughs> Run! Friends of yours, are they? He's caught Dan and Mark. He puts them in the same jar Steve was in. I'm going out there. Maybe I can help. No, you foolish girl. I was born that way. She makes her way to Steve, but he's not sure what to do now. I think they've got the hatchet. And what are you going to use? Well, all they have is my pocket knife. Look, you get back when you're safe. If you stop throwing her around like a dirty sock and let her take part in stuff, good things can tend to happen. Will he figure that out? Stay tuned until next episode because at the moment I don't know either. Enoch grabs Valerie and holds her out in front of Anidu. It's not hard to guess what his next step in negotiation is going to be. And you tell me where that book is or I'm going to kill her. No, I mean it. I'll kill her. Please, this is no spur-of-the-minute thing with me. I've been after that book of yours for over two years now. Two years? Then you were the one... That's right. The night that the volunteer from the audience was killed, you never could understand why that trick failed. Well, I did it. I thought Fitzhugh was going to start the spook sounds, but maybe it's at the end of the tape. It's all here. And now it's mine, all of it. You've got what you want. Let them go. I leave witnesses running loose all over the place? I think not. They die too. He's already killed an innocent man from your world for all this. Why would he hesitate to kill little people? Please, let them go free. They won't go to the police. They're fugitives too. I can't take that chance. It's the police checking out those boys' story. They're not finding anything. Come on, let's get out of here. Help! Help! Police! Help! Murder! Then again, you never know when you're going to come across the most interesting thing you've seen all week. All right, what's going on in here? You got here just in time. I just caught this man. He's an escaped prisoner, Inidu, the magician. And not only that, I also caught some little people. They're over there in the glass jar. He forgot Inidu's hands are free. The cop isn't finding any little people. Better come up with something quick, Enog. He's hidden them. Look, he's the ghost. He's the one who's been haunting this place. I, I can prove it to you. He's got a tape recorder right over here. Yeah, but it's at the end of the tape. Just listen. Ghostly moans, footsteps. You never could understand why that trick failed, could you? The night that the the volunteer from the audience got killed. No, don't touch it. Or maybe fits you rewound it and hit the record button. You obnoxious little genius, you. Enog is going to prison, Inidu is exonerated, and the little people are headed back to camp. It sounds like Inidu's going to be all right. I'd like to stick around and see what happens next. <laughs> you would, would you? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Bless him. He remembered. <laughs> Barry was delighted and Fitzhugh was happy that Barry was happy. Internally, he was quietly sulking a little, though. He was really hoping for that big lollipop. My boy, If you dialed the re dial dialed if you dialed the wrong address, Di oh come on! I'll drink from the other glass. You lick that up. <clears throat> Performing shows all over the place. Shows, I can say shows, not shoes. I am not Ed Sullivan.